Thank you, Saul. It's um, killing me with kindness. Too, too, too nice and, and generous an introduction. Um, thank you also for the opportunity to be here and give this lecture in this series. Um, and it is a place that I have, uh, this is my first time here, but it is a place I've regarded with great respect and curiosity from afar because of the quality and breadth of the programming that happens here at the center and the scholarship and the ways it opens outwards to, to, to the public. So it's um, wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to start with, if you'll indulge me, with a joke. And I'd like to use this joke to introduce this topic. And the joke is two old Jewish gentlemen are sitting on a park bench, and one of them turns to his friend, and he looks at him, and then he just says one word, and the word is oi. And the second guy, his buddy, looks at him, and then he says oi. And the first one says oi. And the second one says oi. And they keep going like this. Uh, for a few minutes, and finally the first one looks at his friend and says, I thought we agreed not to talk about Israel. <laughs> so this is a subject, uh, today's talk, which is about Israel and Zionism, uh, excuse, excuse me, Israel and human rights, which for many people inside the Jewish world, outside the Jewish world, uh, is a double oi, right? It's a conjunction of topics that are each in their own right controversial, fraught with uh, controversy and debate, and, and not hard, to, not easy to talk about, and very hard to ar uh, very, very easy to argue about, not um, easy to talk about. So uh, what I want to try and do today is share some of the stories from this book I wrote, which tries to explain the relationship between them, and move beyond what I think are a familiar set of debates. But first, let me back up and tell you sort of how I think about what this debate is and, and the moment we're in right now. Uh, and the simplest way to do that is to show you this image you can see on these screens. Uh, we just finished marking 2018's double anniversary, right? The anniversary of the 70th uh, anniversary, I should say, of the creation of the State of Israel and then the founding of the modern international human rights program uh, embodied by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Both are from 1948, but if they share a history and a common date, a birth date, many people today imagine them as polar opposites. Kind of, this is a coincidence, or maybe it's a cruel irony that they're both from 1948 because they're viewed by many people, again, within the Jewish world, outside the Jewish world, among scholars, among activists, uh, as polar opposites. And what do I mean by that? I put up this slide uh, when I talk about this book just to show some of the range and the spectrum and the extremes of how these things are depicted, uh, not to push in any one direction. Um, and I think the striking thing for me when you look at these images is that they're polar opposite or mirror images. More specifically, on parts of the left, and I hasten to add parts of the left, not the whole left, Zionism is viewed today as at best a kind of clannish tribalism and at worst, a kind of uh, apology or ideology for a rogue state that is linked to white supremacy, apartheid, police brutality, you name it. Uh, on parts of the right, and again, I hasten to add on parts of the right, not everywhere on the right, human rights are seen as whatever they might have been, de facto anti-Semitic, as a politicized weapon which is used to attack and single out Israel, uh, as a, a force which is undermining the security and legitimacy of the Jewish people, uh, one prominent uh, American Jewish intellectual gave a talk recently, said human rights were the worst thing to happen to the Jewish people in the last 70 years. So my question going into this research was how do we get here and was it always this fraught and always this polarized? Uh, and I went looking to try and explain not why such and such a group makes this claim today or such and such a group makes this claim, but basically what was happening in 1948 and what were Jews doing who were living in that moment and watching these two dramas rise up at the same time. And what I found is a story that I think can tell us something both about the history of Zionism, which isn't commonly understood about what it meant and who was doing it vis-a-vis uh, -vis international law and world politics um, across the 20th century, as well as about the history of human rights this thing we take for granted, but which is also a movement associated with groups and law and political debates. So this story in the book, um, I tell through the lives of several people, but primarily these five people. And I call them the lawyer, the activist, the rabbi, the philanthropist, and the diplomat. And today I'm gonna talk primarily about the lawyer. This is the fellow up there in that corner, uh, the far uh, upper right left corner. Uh, and his life, because uh, 
in his life, and I'll tell you a lot about him, you can begin to see many of the themes I'm interested in capturing in this book and many of the questions I just presented to you about human rights and Zionism, what was their relationship, and what happened afterwards, and of course the big question which is how should we as scholars or a public think about them today and the larger things they represent. So that's what I want to do uh, in these remarks in this lecture. Uh, and I'm going to start um, by, whoops, uh, slide goes slightly out of order. Bear with me. Okay, I'm going to start with this slide uh, and with a basic uh, set of kind of observations to keep in mind about thinking about the history of this topic called human rights as well as Zionism. The idea of human rights has a long pedigree, right? And people can point to ancient Greek and Roman ideals of justice and equality. People can point to Jewish and Christian ideals of justice and equality. Uh, and there's a long prehistory, and scholars debate about what that connection is to our day and our values. But for my purposes, this story is a story which really comes about after World War II. And that's the reason we have something called a Universal Declaration of Human Rights created in that moment after World War II. What was that about? Well, it was about the nations of the world coming together and saying that we've just had this genocidal war, we've just had this global catastrophe, and we need a new approach. We need a new approach for law, for international law. We can no longer trust states to do the right thing by their own citizens in many cases, so we need a new kind of law which is going to curb sovereignty. Sovereignty itself was the enemy. It means it prevents us from helping other people. And it led, in some cases, to sovereignty extreme, countries invading other countries, Nazi Germany on the march, and so on and so forth. So what we need to do is have a law that's going to reach over the heads of the leaders of governments and guarantee the rights of people inside these various countries, not just as citizens, right, not just protected by a constitution or a bill of rights, but also as people who can appeal above the heads of their governments to something else, to another realm of international law. And that meant, as I say here, limiting state sovereignty. On the other hand, at the same moment as the United Nations comes together and proclaims this, they say something else. And they also say sovereignty is a good thing. The world of empires is crumbling. It will be no more, right? And we need to replace it with something. And the obvious thing is called the nation state, which means we build countries. And these countries are sovereign states, just like states have existed before. But now there'll be many, many more of them. One of those states is Israel. And this is why, of course, the United Nations votes and decides there is this conflict in the Middle East, one of many conflicts there. So what we're going to do is we're going to create different nation states, give the Jews sovereignty. So the question for me, thinking about this, was a puzzle, which is, how are these things related? And also, why did Jews, at the same time as they're seeking sovereignty, that's what we want. We want a government, right? The first time in 2,000 years. Why do they also seek to limit sovereignty, to say we want international laws, which change what governments, how much power they have? And the simplest answer that most people give is to say, well, duh, it's two different groups of Jews, right? Why would we assume it's the same people? Some Jews, to put it very starkly, want land. They want a government. They want guns. They say, we come out of the experience of genocide. We need a home, and we need a way to protect ourselves, and that's what really matters. And other Jews perhaps think more uh, universally or think more broadly and say, no, we need to have law and rights and international institutions to protect us. In other words, some Jews choose the universalism of international law, and others choose the particularism of nationalism, of the nation and of the nation state. And that is the story, in a nutshell, that I found most people were telling about human rights and Zionism, which kind of makes it obvious that there would be conflicts along the way and that we would get into a position where that nation state would fight with its neighbors and would have trouble with its minorities and with this larger pro pro sphere of global justice. Um, but it turns out the story is much more complicated uh, in an interesting and very surprising way. And here I'll go back and start with the story of this one person I want to tell you a lot about today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because it turns out that the sense of two Jews and what people are vis-a-vis -vis internationalism and nationalism doesn't make sense if you look at the people who are actually doing the work in 1948. So today, the hero du jour for international human rights law uh, is a man named Hirsch Svi Lauterpacht. He's a Polish Jew. I'll tell you more about where he comes from. Uh, he's considered to be the founding father of international human rights law, he's considered by many to be the greatest international lawyer of the 20th century. Why? 
Among other things, he's the man who pretty much coined the modern term crimes against humanity. He gave us much of the building blocks of the international law that we take for granted. By that, I mean he was advising the Americans and the British at Nuremberg about these trials of Nazi war criminals. He came up with one of the early influential versions of the International Bill of Human Rights, the idea of having a legal code. Uh, and he also developed the European Convention on Human Rights, an idea of having a court system in Europe for human rights. This is only a small number of the things he did. I was struck, even after I finished writing this book, by another book that came out uh, called The Internationalists, a really interesting book by two Yale law professors in which they argue uh, that Lauterpacht is the most important thinker in the creation of the modern liberal order. They say you have to go back to Grotius, a Dutch thinker in the early modern period, to find someone who is as influential in coming up with a world as we know it because of his ideas about war and about uh, crime and international law and so on and so forth. And he had a very distinguished career himself, rising from the Polish shtetl uh, to several degrees across European universities, to a position at the University of Cambridge, and finally to a judgeship on the International Court of Justice in the 1950s. So the interesting thing about Lauterpacht is he fits a certain story that we're primed to think about, which is, okay, he's a Polish Jew from Eastern Europe, and he seeks uh, a route out of the shtetl, and he suffers violence along the way, and then he becomes a person who is a cosmopolitan thinker. But the interesting thing is, he's not just that. At the same time as he's doing this, he's a Zionist leader. So the same man who comes up with much of what we think of as universal human rights also spends 1948 drafting a version of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. He's writing it. Why is he doing that? Because he spent three decades involved in the Zionist movement, and he's actually been the Zionist movement's lawyer, their outside counsel, in the 30s and 40s as they go to him for legal advice. And what's that advice about? A conflict over land, a conflict over nationalism, the pursuit of a Jewish home, and the conflict between Jews and Arabs, and eventually Israelis and Palestinians in this place. Not only this, he's someone who uh, is giving legal advice to the Israeli government in 1948 while there's a war happening, while he's at the UN giving advice about what human rights should look like, he's telling the Israelis how they should deal with the war questions about their war, the prosecution of it, and the fights against the Arab world. So he's fully inside these two stories that we're familiar with but don't think of necessarily as intersecting. And with that biographical observation, it begins to be even more of a puzzle. So what, what did he think in 1948? What was the source of his ideas? and what was driving him. So now let me go back and tell you a little bit about it. And his story starts in Eastern Europe in 1918 uh, with the end of World War I. <clears throat> he is living in Lemberg, AKA Lvov, Lviv, today Western Ukraine, then Eastern Poland, uh, and then very much a contested city, right? The Russian Empire is crumbling, the Habsburg Empire is crumbling, and all of the different peoples of this region are trying to figure out what kind of countries they will get. The Ukrainians and the Poles both uh, are building new nation states and want this city. And the Jews are, as they often are in this part of the world, caught in the middle uh, and trying to figure out uh, what to do to survive and what they should envision justice as. This is the situation in the fall of 1918. Uh, and Hirsch Svi Lauterpacht is a young law student at the city's university. Uh, he is also a young Zionist leader. He's founded a bunch of organizations already at this point. He's taught himself Hebrew. He's dreaming of making Aliyah, that is, moving to the Jewish community in the land of Israel, AKA what is about to be British controlled Palestine. And uh, he's thinking about over there, but first he's dealing with the reality of life in a very violent part of Eastern Europe that is getting more violent. What happens is that the Jewish community of this city uh, declares itself neutral in this fight between Polish and Ukrainian forces. Uh, and this neutrality leads uh, the Polish side to view them as being pro-Ukrainian, right? Because you can't really be neutral in Eastern Europe. So either you're with us or you're on the other guy's team. Uh, and af in the aftermath of a battle between those two national forces, uh, a pogrom takes place a three-day pogrom in uh, November 1918 in Lviv, a.k.a. Lviv, Lemberg. Uh, this is a pogrom which, like many pogroms, uh, 
people initially thought that there were thousands upon thousands of deaths. It was, there weren't, uh, but there was still far too many lives lost, and the numbers are still contested, somewhere between 75 to 150, 150 people killed. But it immediately became an international crisis, uh, so much so that there are protests in the streets, and so much so that the leaders of the world, President Wilson, uh, his British and French counterparts, meeting in Paris, uh, decide that maybe Poland doesn't deserve to be a free, independent country because of the violence that the Poles, and it was painting with a broad brush, uh, have inflicted against the Jewish population. This becomes an interesting, important diplomatic debate. But for our purposes, what is striking is the reaction of this fellow, Lauterpacht. So what does he do? During the violence, he forms a self-defense brigade uh, after it ends, he actually contemplates briefly an assassination plot against the uh, Polish military official who he holds most responsible. In the end, he doesn't do that. Uh, nor does he issue a plea for tolerance. He issues a manifesto together with his young Zionist friends in which he demands uh, minority rights. What does that mean? He says, the only way we will get justice in this emerging Polish state is if you give us recognition as a distinct people, the Jewish people, and we want our own schools in Hebrew and Yiddish, and we want to have our uh, legal recognition as a national minority. Uh, this is an image of him with a group of other young leaders. Uh, this is a description in Polish of some of the, of the uh, petitions they're lobbying, and this is one of the a subsequent petition that he wrote in the same spirit, uh, saying, we want to be part of this Polish country, but we need special protections as a minority. And if you don't give this to us, we, want, we will go above your head to the international community. What does that mean? To this new League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations that's been created. And we're going to appeal to them to give us these rights and to guarantee us these rights. And what these rights really mean uh, is it may be familiar to some people in here what I'm describing, to others not at all. This is both individual civil rights, right? I want equality before the law in this country as a minority. and. I want protections as a member of a minority group. It's probably more familiar because there's some contemporary resonances even in Canadian right, law and politics about minorities and language and things like that. And he's saying that's what we want. We want both of them. Uh, Lauterpacht does not succeed with this. There are some of these rights created uh, in the Polish constitution in theory, um, but he actually gives up on Poland pretty quickly. And he moves to Vienna, like many Polish Jews. Uh, and he moves to Vienna and starts another degree. Uh, and in Vienna, he faces a new problem, which is a rising current of anti-Semitism, which is not on the battlefields in the messy uh, war zones, the border zones of Eastern Europe, but in the heart of this rebuilding, re-emerging Central Europe, where there are people trying to keep Jews out of the universities, right? There is a numerous clauses, as it's called, quotas. Uh, so what does Lauterpacht do? He starts an organization, which is still around today, called the World Union of Jewish Students. Uh, he's the founder. And he dreams it up because he says, we need to band together Jewish students from all across Europe and beyond who are being discriminated against and be able to create a force and we can advocate for ourselves and demand rights and access to education as well as other things. So uh, he launches this and officially debuts in 1924. Here again, he is beginning to think as a member of minority and to demand certain minority rights as well as equality uh, for himself and for other Jews. And he actually begins to petition the League of Nations and say, can we have official status? Can Jewish students be officially recognized? Because our problems can't be solved if you just treat us like Austrian students or like Polish students. Because those are the contexts in which we're being discriminated against precisely for being accused of being foreign. right? And what's interesting about this is he pursues this at the same time as he's continuing to work on the Zionist cause. So here is where conceptually what I'm talking about for me was an aha moment because it begins to be visible in terms of how he sees law and how he sees the world and how he sees what will become human rights. Let me make an observation about this. People are not using the phrase human rights at this point in time. People are talking about the rights of man as a philosophical idea People are talking about humanity. People are talking about rights. But the language of how you get protection from international law and the language of justice is this language of minority rights or group rights. And this is a language that Lauterpacht and other people like him are pushing upwards 
and it's being incorporated into this League of Nations system. So the reality is there's 40 million people in interwar Europe across several countries who are classified as minorities. And this wasn't just the Jews. This could be Ukrainians in Poland. This could be Germans in Poland. This could be Hungarians in Poland or Germans or Poles in one of these other countries, right? Uh, and all of these people gain a certain status of protection and the right to appeal above the heads of their governments to the League of Nations set in Geneva at which they can get in theory, in theory is the big, uh, the key thing here, protection and redress. For Lauterpacht, what's the relationship between this and Zionism? And the answer is they're kind of two sides of the same coin. He's saying as a Jew who identifies as a member of an ethnic nation, I want protection for my nation as a national minority here in Europe as part of this minority system, and I also want a territorial homeland. So he looks at this situation out in the world and he says, we need both of these because we're never going to be in one place. We are a diaspora, just like all these other peoples in Europe who are spread across. We're never going to be in just one place, but we need to have one place where we're the majority because everywhere else we will be and are the minority. And the two kind of go together in his mind. This is why the first actual piece of legal writing he writes is a dissertation in which he praises the Balfour Declaration, which is this powerful yet ambiguous promise by the British to the Jews of a homeland in Palestine. He praises this actually as an advancement for international law. Why is, it, why, why is that so? And the answer is because he says, the British just seized this chunk of land in the Middle East. But rather than just making it part of their empire and saying it's British and maybe we'll let the Jews come or not, they're saying it's not actually officially British. We are holding this kind of in trust in a, what's called a mandate on behalf of the international community for the future benefit of Jews and others who live there. Now, we'll get to the controversy of Palestinian Jewish claims to it. But the key thing is, Lauterpacht says, this is sovereignty pulling itself back. This is a moment where international law is actually able to say it is on top of even the British, even the British Empire. So this is a victory which goes hand in hand for the idea that we can have our protections as a minority over here in Europe built into this system. And these are complicated, uh, subtle ideas, but this is how he has this kind of bicameral you know, vision of the world. Because much like many Jews today, he thinks about Israel, his land of Israel, as a place that he has an attachment to. He marries a girl from Jerusalem. He thinks about moving there a couple times. But even when he's not there, he thinks it's important for Jews to have that place, but also to have the protections they need elsewhere out in the world. And this is a story which, oops, uh, oh yeah. This is a story which opens outwards, as I talk about in the book, to several other people like him, who are kind of a network of activists pursuing this in different ways throughout this time. Meanwhile, he leaves Vienna, he goes to England, he rises up in English academia, uh, and he continues to be active in these different things I've described to you. He's getting memos and writing back and forth with the British Zionist leadership, and there's a simple reason for this. Not only do they know him from his earlier years, but because he basically marries into, uh, you call it Zionist royalty, meaning he is uh, married, uh, related by marriage to Abba Ibn, Abba Eben, the great diplomat and Zionist orator and, and leader, uh, as well as Chaim Herzog. Um, they all marry into the same family. So he's got these deep personal connections, uh, and which is one reason, along with his eminence, his prominence in the field of international law, that they keep turning to him for legal advice about different things. So he's kind of a two-tracks thing that's happening. Uh, as you get into the 30s, he watches with despair as the situation worsens in Poland, and he watches uh, as the war and the Holocaust take place, and his family is wiped out, his parents and, and a huge number of his family are wiped out. And then he is immediately thrust into this two-part question, right, which is what's going to happen with the Jews and what's going to happen with justice in the world after World War II. And the first part of this is he begins to think again about what international law can do. And he begins to think about how we can restrain the power of governments and give people rights that even when their governments abuse them, they can have justice somewhere. And he is, as I mentioned earlier, he gets drafted into the work of uh, the Nuremberg trials, where he literally drafts uh, 
statements for the British and American prosecutors um, and gives a lot of behind the scenes advice as well as writing um, memos for a group called the World Jewish Congress as they're trying to say, we want to be able to speak as Jews at these trials to, t to testify about what happened to us as a people, not just what they did, but how we as victims experienced it. At the same time as Lauterpacht is doing this, he's continuing to have one eye on Zion, right? And this brings me to the really interesting question of that year of 1948. What is going on? What is he thinking in his head? He's watching a terrible, terrible spate of violence in British-controlled Palestine turn into a civil war and then intensify with the threat of an all-out regional war. Uh, and he's watching this drama rise for him of return and renewal of Jews going back to their ancestral homeland and building something that he's dreamed of, which is a modern state there. So what is he doing? And the answer is he's doing both because, again, he sees them as interrelated. What does that mean? The promise of 1948 for Lauterpacht is a promise and that basically that you will be able to um, order the world, which is to say you'll be able to create a system in which people who don't have, who are homeless, have a nation state of their own. But you're not going to make it any nation state homogenous. That's impossible. They tried that after World War I. It didn't work. They knew it then. So you need something else. That's where minority rights, rechristened as human rights, comes in and international law comes in. So he says, this is a way to order the world. The Jews get their home. And then this new human rights system we're going to build at the UN is going to make this Jewish government and all governments operate fairly and equally towards their minorities and all kinds of people, right? everybody in their societies. But already in 1948, he's articulating a pretty idealistic vision and then beginning to be quite disappointed. Um, oh, here's, this, here's one other slide I can show you. Uh, and I put this slide in here to kind of bring in a frame of reference, which is sometimes forgotten, right? Um, when he looks out at the world, he sees, OK, there's a nationalist conflict between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. So we create two states. And that way, we don't make each state only Jews or only Arabs. In fact, the final UN plans envision some mixed populations of both. But you create two separate nation states. Same thing's happening in India and Pakistan. So for him, this is kind of an ordering of the world. And once you have things ordered, then you can begin to make governments basically act better and, and, t and ratchet down a little bit of their sovereignty. Now, I said he becomes quite uh, disappointed. Um, and he's disappointed by what human rights is beginning to be already in 1948. Actually, 1947, if we're being specific. Why? Because he says, there's a lot of talk about principles, but I don't think it's been designed well enough to do what it really has to do. Or, you can read the quote here along with me, to a lawyer, the enunciation of a right without the provision of a remedy is a judicial heresy. Right? An effective and enforceable international bill of rights cannot be achieved by verbal incantations and by elegant devices of diplomatic language. So what is he complaining about? Well, he's there. And he's watching what's going on with the drafting of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is growing and growing to include all kinds of different rights, economic rights, social rights, educational rights, very important things. But what's not happening is a concrete way to make those rights truly into law, right? Because the problem with the system as it's being developed is they've essentially said, well, we'll get countries to, to bind themselves into this gradually as we go. And he says, that's the cart before the horse. You should create a system where every government has to obey this as international law. And then you can fill in the details about the rights, and we can argue about them. Instead, we have sort of a laundry list of what we'd love the world to be, but no way to compel countries to do it. And this reminds him all too much of what was at the League of Nations, where there was this law, but it actually wasn't strong enough and couldn't compel all the countries to treat their populations justly. What do you have to do? And here he goes on to say, you need something else, right? Not the formulation of inalienable human rights. That's kind of remarkable. Pause with me and think about this. Right after World War II, right after the Shoah, genocide, right? In this tum tumult of countries being born, empires being dismantled. And he's saying, no, not inalienable human rights, but something, but something else, right? Uh, and that something else is a, a form of international law strong enough 
to really order the world and really force all countries, big and small, to behave, right? And that is something you need to do. And there's a danger that, as he says here, selfish indolence of entrenched interests will prevent that from coming into form. What is that? Let me say a word about that. Well, he reserves uh, actually a lot of his criticism for uh, the British and the Americans and the Soviets because he say, well, you are these powerful countries and we know we need your power to make this system work, right? But you are basically creating a, a carve out where you're going to talk about human rights, but you're not necessarily going to say, you need to sign on to this treaty, you need to apply this law to yourself. And he actually has very harsh words for uh, the idea of the Security Council. Because he says, if you have a UN where some countries are more equal than others, that's a recipe for power uh, that will play out. Sometimes we may like the results, sometimes we may not, but that's a problem with the way the architecture is being designed. What is he really most worried about? And this is where what he's worried about connects to some of the issues that uh, concern many people today. Uh, the answer is not just the weakness of what is being talked about as human rights, but the fact that the weakness makes them susceptible to politicization. It's very easy to twist them around if there's no neutral, universal, legal code that will require all countries to operate the same way or be treated the same way. Uh, and so he gives us this quote in which he says, we have to guard the borderline between law and a most intractable problem, intractable problem of politics. Or again, human rights will become something that you use for politics, right? It'll just be country X uses country Y, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a cruel irony in what he's saying, because it's born of the recognition that the country that used uh, minority rights the most effectively before World War II were, was Germany. Right? And the one country that actually took the system and used it to expand and to use it as a kind of a pretext to expand its imperial reach and then to launch war was doing so in the name of defending rights, the rights of all these Germans who live in Czechoslovakia or in Poland uh, uh, or in Austria. And so he's saying this can easily be politicized and law has to be separate and stronger than it to do that. Now, um, he has some ideas about uh, what can save us um, and what can prevent it even with this reality. His first idea is maybe we need to think smaller. And for this reason, he gets involved in developing the human rights system in Europe with a European court and a European convention, which he says, take a, a unit of countries. They already know each other. It's an established part of the world. They have a common cultural background. They can agree, in theory, um, on this. And we should build there and build that around the world. Secondly, he thinks judges will save us. And he believes in judges. And he writes a whole book about how judges could be truly impartial. Uh, this is an interesting observation in light of the recent debates that some of you may, have been, uh, may be aware about at the International Criminal Court about judges and, and bias at the, at the court. Uh, and thirdly, he has one other idea, which he says is very important. Uh, which is, above all, the most important human right is that of having somewhere to at least voice out the fact that you have been oppressed or unfairly locked up or suffered. Your government has done something to you or another government has. So the right to be heard and more specifically the right to petition. What does that mean? From the start of the UN, as soon as they announced we're doing this project called Human Rights, they begin to get thousands upon thousands of letters from around the world. And these letters arrive, and each letter says, I'm so and so in such and such a country. Um, I've lost, I've been tortured, or I've unfairly lost my right to vote, or this is a violation of what I think is the, the, the actual law of my own country, or um, I think the government is unfairly taking my property, all kinds of claims. And they all arrive, uh, and they arrive to the UN, to this body called the Commission on Human Rights, which is created from 1946 onwards. And the question is what to do with them. Uh, this seems to be the moment, right? The world is actually doing what you would want the world to do, voicing and saying, yes, we want to support this, and we, we need your help. And the UN famously votes in uh, 1947 not to open these letters and reveal their contents to the public and not to address them. And they say, we don't have legal authority to do this. Uh, and the diplomats at this commission uh, on human rights, which includes Eleanor Roosevelt, a whole bunch of other diplomats, they say, we don't legally have the right to do this. 
and it's too politically sensitive. So we're actually not going to disclose the contents of these. We're going to basically bury them in the archives. They're still in the archives today um, in, the, in the UN. So we don't even know some of these requests for help are there. Uh, they say we don't have the authority. We will if we, if we draft a treaty and this and that, but that doesn't happen. Lauterpacht, in this moment, says that is, you know, um, he's, after all, Yiddish-speaking Jew. He says it's a shanda. Um, it's, it's, a terrible, it's a terrible thing because you're not even letting the power of sunlight and, you know, publicity for these individuals rise to the occasion and address this, this issue. Interestingly enough, though, the first place he decides to bring this position publicly is in Israel. Remember, he stayed personally close to those founding Israel. Uh, and in 1950, he gets invited to Jerusalem, and he gets invited to go celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Hebrew University's founding. I haven't given you his whole biography, because there's a lot of it, but suffice to say, I'll mention here, in 1925, he was at the opening of the Hebrew University. He led a delegation of several hundred, 200 Jewish students from Europe to Jerusalem in 1925 to celebrate this university being created. And then he's back 25 years later where he gives two lectures. And what's striking about this is he presents the view I just said to you. This is just a map to show you of the actual status. It's an interesting moment um, because it's the moment where the war is over. Obviously, there's not full peace. Uh, and Jordan has just decided to officially annex the West Bank uh, and hold it as part of its Jordanian territory, which will remain until 1967. Um, but he's not there to talk about that. He's there to talk about human rights and how to save them in this moment. And he says, as you can see, the right of petition by individuals is, in my, essence, in my view, of the essence of an international protection of human rights. This is the most important right. Now, why is he saying this? And this is where I think it's very interesting. He is saying this because he's sitting in front of a bunch of his friends who are now law professors at the Hebrew University and a bunch of other uh, Israeli officials. And he's saying Israel has to take the lead in this. The UN is still debating all the issues I've presented, and he's saying it's not a fait accompli, what's going to happen there. If Israel presses hard for this right, maybe the commission will change, maybe the UN will change. Uh, and he's not wrong about one thing. Uh, one of the things I found surprising in doing the research for this book is Israel is extremely well regarded at the UN in the 1950s. Many, many countries rely on it because they say your country um, First of all, it's full of lawyers, and you have experience with international law, and you also have the prestige, you could call it, of the fact that you were victims of this Holocaust. So people, a lot of different people like the Jews. So we want you to help push forward certain ideas, right? A genocide convention, human rights, uh, and you have technical expertise too. So you can actually trace the memos that flow from the UN Secretariat to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs saying, would you guys please advocate for this position because we think you have a lot of prestige. And there were many in Israel who said, this is great because this is a small country. This is how we're going to win friends and we're going to make our mark. And there were others who said, what are you crazy? We, we, our war is barely over, if not still going. And this is a dangerous neighborhood and we have security needs. It's not for us to be taking the lead on quixotic uh, you know, um, adventures to try and promote human rights. And this is the debate that Lauterpacht triggers in 1950. He actually gets in a fight with some of his old comrades who now are lawyers for the Israeli government. And they say, that's pie in the sky idealism. He should know by now we have security needs and human rights is being politicized, as he acknowledges. And he writes back and says, I can't speak to your security needs, but I think as a Jew, I would hope that you would do more in this front to advance human rights. That's a debate that, um, is not resolved. Um, and in a certain sense, it's a debate we're still having, right, about ideals of what human rights could be and whether those who identify with a Jewish country would wish that it would take the lead versus those who would say, no, it should fulfill its obligation to protect its citizens, right? This is a very familiar debate. Um, what has happened over time, however, is in a certain sense, uh, an amnesia has set in, right? So I want to turn now for a few remaining minutes to talk about um, this theme of amnesia and then to talk about where this story goes and what it means for our moment today. Uh, this is a postage stamp that's issued in 1958 to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm going to go out on a limb and say you couldn't find such a postage stamp issued today in Israel. 
um, because there is a, not only a polarization, but there are many people on the right and the left who view the UN Human Rights Program as hopelessly anti-Israel, if not worse, right? Uh, but there was a time in the 50s where you could issue this postage stamp, and it was seen as something that was an expression of Zionism and state interest uh, and internationalism. It's forgotten. Uh, and I think on both sides of this debate, what's striking is there's a kind of double amnesia, right? People who are most invested in human rights today often forget about their particular visions or attitudes about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, don't know any of this history, right? And they don't know that Israel played a role at the early UN or that there are these figures in the history of international law and human rights who have these deep connections to it. Uh, and on the same uh, side of things, or on the other side, I should say, in terms of Israel and Zionism. People who are deeply invested in Zionism and, and its uh, message and its fortunes and its fate um, are often unaware of this and assume, well, of course, they created Israel because David Ben-Gurion said, boom shmoom, right? He said, uh, we don't need the UN. We need to just protect ourselves, which, in fact, is only half the story because there were these people inside and outside Israel who thought this was one part of a larger process of bringing the Jews back to their home, and creating a better, more just world. There's something striking about this double amnesia. And we can't, I can't promise you that if we could get past it, we would get to a solution. Um, but it allows us to understand something also about the nature of human rights and international law. And uh, I want to close by just sharing with you a few questions about this. In 1948, Lauterpacht was very worried Right? He was worried. But he wasn't worried that Israel was going to turn into something that he would be critical of. He was worried that the world would not be able to separate politics and law. And his vision is if you build law strong enough and you make the system work, then there of course will be politics. And as a lawyer, every lawyer can acknowledge there are some things which the law in theory can't touch right, uh, or shouldn't touch, especially in international affairs. On the other hand, uh, the dream is that law can actually do what it hasn't done yet, which is protect people so when a request for help is made, it doesn't get politicized and turned into one thing or another, or requests for help are not ignored because of politics. Right? So what went wrong? Uh, in my book, I talk a lot about other factors, the Cold War, Arab propaganda, the occupation, which begins in 1967, the clash between um, the US and the Soviet Union and how Jews become part of that, part of the drama of human rights. Many, many things uh, that are, are part of the mix. But something else uh, is striking in this moment um, because something that Lauterpacht thought would happen didn't happen. He imagined eventually every people gets a state. So there's a kind of symmetry to the world. But not everybody got a state, right? And states fall apart. And much of the messiness and much of the controversy involving human rights involves Palestinians and Israelis, where you have a one-state, no-state solution. You have Palestinians. And we debate about what their fate should be, what they need, where they should go, where they should belong, what justice they require. But this system wasn't designed with people like that in mind. The assumption was, and his assumption was, there'll be two states there, and there'll be two states and states everywhere. And so refugees will eventually disappear as a problem. We won't have that issue. We'll still have human rights abuses. But if everybody's inside this legal architecture of states, then the human rights will work. That didn't happen. And I think what also happened is human rights, as it grew in popularity as an idea of a global social justice movement, it became more and more removed from a world of states. And so we have a situation where we talk about the need to protect people but the way we protect them is ultimately by calling on governments to do things, right? Governments should do this or should not do this. Uh, and that state or that sovereignty model it really rests underneath the world of human rights that we have, even as that world and that movement tries to imagine a world where you don't need that. You don't quite need those borders or it shouldn't matter where you are. This is a big problem. Um, and it may be that we need to think about what could go further if we stopped focusing only on rights claims and focus more on what states should look like. Right? And we're in an interesting moment and a terrifying moment because there is, on the one hand, a certain push to say that the state is um, the only thing we need you know, as members of this polity in Canada or the United States or Israel or France. Uh, on the other hand, there is this populism right, which is rising up 
which is seeming to attack the state itself in some cases, as well as, as, well as to attack minorities. Uh, and it's unclear where we go. But something about the history from 48, I think, is really actually uh, telling us that we're still living in that moment. Right? We've never had more consciousness about human rights, but we don't actually have many ways to instrumentalize and realize those rights. And so what we do rely on, and this is what Lauterpacht was worried about, was publicity and politics. And we say, well, we can raise people's awareness through media, um, but we don't have a referee who everyone agrees can tell us this is a rights claim that should go forward. And there are international institutions and there are powerful processes of justice that happen, and yet there's a certain cynicism and crisis of legitimacy that I think sweeps across many different divides um, from right to left, from Israeli to Palestinian, and all those in other places about what human rights can be. So I don't know where it's going, but in the case of Lauterpacht and these other people, it tells us that we have to maybe think backwards to some of these questions at the, at the dawn of this modern era and see what was happening then and what didn't happen to understand the full shape of the world that we inhabit today. Thank you.